one time. Can we make some noise for Jesus this morning? Lord, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. God, thank you for this opportunity to be in this space today. And I'm so excited uh, that you're here this morning. And again, if this is your first time with us or if you're new here, you've been with us a couple times, man, we're excited that you're here. And, uh, and if you've been here with a few times, yo, we're going to go ahead and say you home. So come on, let's go ahead and do this thing, all right? And uh, hey, I'm excited to continue uh, in a collection um, that we actually kicked off uh, the first Sunday of this month. It was Serve Sunday, so we were actually here on campus serving. Um, but the, there, there was a service that was produced uh, for online, and we kicked off this series called uh, I Love My City. And here we are in week three of this collection. And the idea behind this collection, it's really in the name. That we love this city, and one of the ways that we express our love for the city is by serving the city. And uh, if you've been here, you know, any length of time, this is week 23, you've, you've figured that out. Like, those folks are always talking about serving the city. And we do because we feel like that is part of the church mission. That we don't serve because we want something from people, but we serve because there's something that we're trying to get to you. We're trying to get the love of Jesus to you, the hope of Jesus to you, the peace of Jesus to you, the grace of Jesus to you. And not that those that we serve don't have that, but we just are there sometimes just to remind, hey, that it is here. Y'all tracking with me. So we serve this city. And yesterday, that's what we did. We had two teams in two different locations at two different times in the blazing heat of Alabama serving this city. Come on now. We were here on campus helping to renovate that garden, and then we were over in the Northwood Family Fair uh, in, in the Northwood community and just being available, loving and, and, and smiling and all of that. Sometimes serving is not what we dug up or what we lift or what we move, but sometimes we serve with a smile. And uh, we got to do that uh, yesterday over in Northwood, so really excited about that. And understand this, this is what we believe. We don't believe that God has called us uh, to change this city. And you're like, what? Isn't that what the church wants to do? No, because that's not our mission. But we have been called to serve the city. And just maybe, just maybe, by us serving the city, the work of the Holy Spirit takes over and begins to reveal the heart of Father to people. And that what is what leads to change. That's what leads to transformation. So all we're doing, we're just being a facilitator. That's it. We're facilitating moments. We're participating in moments of grace for the work of the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. And I believe this, that God has his hand on this area. And when I say this area, I'm talking about Huntsville, Madison, Athens, Harvest, whatever. I'm talking about Huntsville. It's all Huntsville is what we're going to call it today. Some of you who live in Madison, it's like, no, there is a difference <laughs> I'm going to move on. But it's not enough to say, like, yo, we're saved, and we're going to sit down, and that's it. I'm good. doesn't really matter if you're good. That's not what it is. But, no, we've got to be moved into action. This is what James talks about. Belief in Jesus produces action in us, that we don't check out of the game, but we stay in the game because our city is our responsibility. No one else is going to do it. No one else is coming, right? Understand this, like God has a plan for you. That's why you're here. Look, everybody's moving here. They, they, they called us the number one best place to live in the nation. So folks are like, yo, I, I got to get down to Huntsville. But listen, family, you're here, and you may be trying to figure out why you're here, but you're here because God has a plan. You didn't expect this move. You didn't expect, some, some of you heard of Alabama, I was like, Alabama? is the electricity going on down there. Like, and I know that because I've been places and they look at me like, I didn't know you were from Alabama. I'm like, why not? What did you think? <laughs> you would be happy to know we're the best place in this country to live, including your city that I'm in right now. I take up for my city because <laughs> I love my city. So today we're going to do that. We're going to continue this conversation around I love my city. And we're going to use Genesis uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 18, particularly 18, uh, to have the conversation. So if you have your copy of God's Word, uh, you can turn with me there to Genesis chapter 2. And if you 
or anywhere near John, you can come on back to the front. And uh, you can track with me on the screen right here. Genesis 2, verse 15, it says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And here's the verse that I want us to focus on today. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Come on, let's pray. Father, we thank you today. God, we thank you for your grace, your love, and your mercy. God, thank you for these moments that we share together. God, thank you for the privilege, for the honor to be able to gather around your word. Lord, I pray that we don't take these moments lightly or for granted because we know that there are places across this world that they can't do this without fear of their life, Lord. And so thank you for the honor in this country that we get to, to do this, Lord. And I pray over these next few moments, God, that, uh, Lord, you incline our ears. God, let us hear what it is you want to speak to us. Open our eyes. Let us see what it is that you're trying to show us. And so, Lord, we say this, speak because we're listening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Come on, come on. Everybody said? Amen. 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 So, family, I got a question for you. Do you love your neighbors? That's silence. <laughs> your neighbors are in here. That's what it is. <laughs> but it's a real question, right? Like, come on, be honest. Like, do you, do you like your neighbors? It's a big thing of who your neighbors are. You know, especially if, you know, if, if you're looking for a home or maybe an apartment. Like, it's a big deal who the neighbors are because that could make or break the location. Or if, if you're selling a house, it's, it's really important then, right? Because you're, you're hoping Jimbo, and if your name is Jimbo and him, it's not you. But you're hoping Jimbo's not home when the potential buyers pull up to view the house. So you're praying, Lord, let him be gone out, you know, to um, rule king or whatever. Is that the name of the store? I don't know. Let Jimbo be gone. If your neighbors are great, you're like, awesome, let them be home. But who your neighbors are is very important because we can assume that everybody's like, you know, has have the same values in us. But really quickly when you have neighbors sometimes, you realize that that's not the case. And for Katie and I, in, in all the different places that we've lived, we've always had good neighbors. I, I can't really think of any time that we didn't have good neighbors. We've always had pretty good neighbors. The only time I can really think of, it was before we were married, I had my apartment, and, you know, I had a, a, a first-level uh, apartment. And that has pros and cons. There are pros to it where you're bringing the groceries in or you're trying to move in. But there are some cons to it depending on who lives above you. Now, that was the con in this situation. Like, for whatever reason, I couldn't figure out what was happening between the hours of, like, 12 and 2 a.m. It seemed like that was the moment where they decided it was time for P90X, that it was time for Tybo. Like, I just didn't understand. I was like, I don't know what's happening. I didn't know if it was a fraternity that was upstairs. It felt like it was stumped the yard or something that was happening. All kind of noise, pots, pans. Like, I, I, I just didn't get it. I didn't pick those neighbors. Obviously, I would have picked someone else. Now, some of you guys have some neighbors right now that you're thinking about, like, I hope they go ahead and put their house on the market. They need to get in here and get that prayer during the offering time so they can go ahead and move on. If only we pick our neighbors. But, family, the truth is we don't pick who our neighbors are, right? We don't get to choose who they are. And with that being the case, sometimes it just may not be ideal. Like who your neighbor are just may not, is may not be the choice that you would make. Who your neighbor is may not be someone that you understand. But know this, and we know this, we don't live in this city alone. We live in this city with neighbors. And you've probably already gathered this. I'm not talking about the family next door, but I'm talking about the people who make up this city. And so this morning... 
I want to speak from this headline, how to love my neighbor. Because we can't say that we love this city and we don't love our neighbor. And so it's one thing to know that we're called to love our neighbor, but it's another thing to know how to love our neighbor. And that's what I want us to talk about today and have a conversation around this morning. And so looking at our text here in Genesis 2, from the beginning, it's very clear that God says, like, it's not good for man to live alone. Now, often we consider this verse to be a verse that's solely about marriage or, or a verse that is about marriage. But the reality is, family, I don't think this verse is just a verse about marriage. But rather, I believe this is a verse about life, that life is not intended to be lived alone. Now, here's why this isn't a verse that is just about marriage. And I'll kind of pause there, and now I guess I'm going to rant for a little bit. At least I gave you a heads up. Married people often make the mistake of projecting the fact that they're married onto other people, right? And you're like, what are you talking about? They say things like, well, man, just keep, keep doing right. Keep pushing on. You're going to find someone someday, baby. They out there, you know, your, your grandmother or somebody. Or, you know... This is just a time. Focus on you. It's only a season. I remember when, and now I'm married. I don't even remember the time before, right? They always project that, the, the, the idea that you're single or that they're married onto you, right? And when they communicate in that way, it's making this assumption or it's really communicating this, that singleness is a sentence rather than singleness being a calling, right? Maybe singleness isn't a season. Maybe singleness is a calling. Now, you're sitting there like, no, 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 Pastor, it is not a calling for me. I don't come into agreement with that. I know there's more to agree, the three in here, and that's fine. But for sometimes, that's not the case. And we sometimes assume that people can't do certain things because they're single. Are you called to ministry? I don't know that because you're not married. Or, or you want to do this at your company, but I don't know because you're not married. But when I look, Jesus, <laughs> he was single, right? Surely we're not saying that he wasn't effective in life. Surely we're not saying that he didn't accomplish his purpose and, and, and the reason why he was here because he was single. Or even Paul, you could look at Paul as well because maybe you're like, yeah, but that's Jesus. Okay, well, look at Paul. He was Single, So we've got to move from these promoting this non-truth that singleness is a sentence or that singleness is a season when, in fact, singleness may be a calling. But hold that to February and we'll come back to it. But the fact that Jesus was single, it didn't mean that he was alone. He had friends, Right? He, he had friends, uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, a friend that he was so connected with that when Lazarus, when he got to the tomb, it says that Jesus wept. So he cared about Lazarus. That was his friend. He was in community with them. So he wasn't alone, but he did life with others. So we got to lose the idea that singleness is an issue rather than see it as a calling. So this is why I believe that verse is not just a verse about marriage. So when God says it's not good, for man to be alone, he's meaning as a way of life. For some, that may include marriage, but for others may not. But the point is still the same, that it is not good for man to be alone, to live life alone. And so if we're saying that we love this city, we just can't be talking about the, the parks, the shops, the restaurants, the amenities, or all the new things that are coming here. But it means that we must love the people of this city because it's not good for us to live alone. We can't live an isolated life that I've got mine and I'm going to shut the door and that's it. But no, we're, we're called to get in the trenches and live and do life with people. And you know that this includes people who don't vote like us. <gasps> Can you believe that? Oh, man, could it be your neighbor may vote as a Democrat? 
Uh-oh, can you believe your neighbor may actually vote as a Republican? And they actually still love you and love people? Regardless of which way they vote? That's a real thing. It could actually be that way. It could mean people who don't think like you. You got another opinion, the nerve. It could be them. It could be the people who don't believe like us. Why do we get upset sometimes if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, if you follow the way of Jesus? Why do we get upset so time, so, so much when people who don't believe like us don't have the same worldview as us? They're not supposed to. They, they don't have the same worldview of us. But if you're so busy talking about why they're wrong, why you can't stand them, guess what? They never will see the truth that you have encountered, right? So it's okay if they don't believe like us. In fact, if you're in here and you don't believe like us, I'm glad you're here. And, and shout out to you for coming to a space that you didn't know what you were going to encounter this morning. But can I tell you, we appreciate that you're here. I thank God that you're here. And I'm not going to force you to believe like us because I can't do that. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit that does. I'm just creating a space for that to happen. Or we are creating a space for that to happen. But our love for people with that. Right? So people don't vote like us. They don't think like us. Uh, the worldview is different than us. But that doesn't mean that we have to agree with everything that they're saying. We can still love them. Right? But that doesn't mean we agree with their lifestyle, their choices, their, their, their worldview or any of that. But we love them because of this truth that just like me and just like you, they too were created in the image of God. That they are an image bearer of God. And so because of that, we love them. That just as much as Jesus died on the cross for you and me, he died on the cross for them. Know that. So we're called to love the people of this city. Because the reality is, family, we need each other. You really do. Try to do anything on your own, just in life. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to work. And if you may think it is, it is far less than what it could be. We need each other. So the old song, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. (laughs) It's not true. It sounds good, but it's not good. No, we do need somebody else. We need each other. Because if you're going to live a fulfilling life, some friends help me with that. Y'all supposed to love me. But if we're going to live a fulfilling life, if we're going to live a life of purpose and a life of being a difference maker, then it means you're going to live a life that involves people. Because here's the truth. The greatest gifts in life, they aren't brought into your life, but they walk into your life. The greatest gifts that you will experience will be relationships and connections and people that you have met along the way. It's not going to be anything that just is brought to your life. It's not going to be some pair of sneakers or some trip or anything like that. But no, it's going to be people who walk into your life. People who were the thing that you needed just when you needed it. The people who came into your life when you were ready to give up but came into your life encouraging you, telling you to keep on, keep believing, keep hope and keep trusting. Those are the greatest gifts of life. The people who were in the room when everyone else walked out. The people who were there when everybody gave up. The people who were there that said you would never amount to anything but the friend who kept praying. The person who stuck in your corner who kept believing in you and pushing you to see the reality of who God is and what he wants to do in your life. We need that friend. I'm only standing here because I had that friend or those friends or those people. Because we don't get anywhere on our own family. That's why we can never get to this point like, yo, I did it myself. You ain't do nothing yourself. First of all, it was the grace of God. But then it was the people and the relationships that helped you see something that you couldn't see. That helped pull something and draw something out of you that you didn't even know that was there. And so if you want to live an isolated life, then you're going to live an unfulfilled life. Because it's only in relationship that you get to be connected with people that can see something in you, pull something out of you, and push you into purpose. 
So I don't want to live an isolated life because that's not the best life. Now, understand this. When I'm talking about a fulfilled life, when I'm talking about the best life, I'm not talking about lights, camera, action, fame, and money, and all these things. No, I'm talking about living a life in purpose and on purpose for the kingdom of God and for the glory of Jesus Christ. And if it includes some of those things, then shout out to you. But the underlining goal in the win is my life to glorify Jesus. And he puts us in relationships with people to pull that out of us. Some of us, we need a Paul if we're a Timothy. We need Paul to say, hey, Timothy, don't let anyone discourage you because of your youth. Stir up the gift. Remember when your grandmother, your your mother, remember the things that they taught you. No, stir up the flame. Stir up the gift in you because there's something that God has put in you. And if we're Peter, we need a Paul to check us. To say, yo, what you doing? You know that ain't right. We need people in our lives so we can't live an isolated life, but we have to live a life in community. And that begins by loving our neighbor. And so here's the first way to love our neighbor to begin living a fulfilling life is to listen to them. If recent history has shown us anything, we don't know how to communicate or we don't know the definition of listening. Whether it was the height of the political season, uh, discussions on various social issues or religions, religious ones. Like we saw discussions that weren't really discussions but were rather shouting matches. We got to witness people communicate like two five-year-olds fighting over a Paw Patrol toy. <laughs> Grown like adults. We lost the ability to communicate. And when there's no communication, there's no understanding. And I think it's the inability to communicate that has led to uh, erosion in so many areas within our culture and society. And perhaps the reason for this is many of us have lost the true definition of communication. And so, well, what is it? The dictionary defines communication as this. A process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of symbols, signs, signs. Or behavior. So in other words, communication is when you speak, they listen, you stop talking, and then they reply to what you just communicated. Instead, communication has become where either we're both speaking at the same time, and in most cases we're really shouting at each other, or the person who is speaking And then the person who is supposed to be listening is not really listening, but they're just preparing their response. They're a distracted listener. And family, we can't be a distracted listener, but we must be an active one. But we can only be an active listener when we just choose to be quiet so that we can actually indeed listen. And I love the Bible. It speaks on this. It speaks on everything. In Proverbs 17, 28, it says this. Now, this is the Bible speaking. You see it up there already. Even a fool is thought to be wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. The Bible's saying you could even, you could be a fool. (laughs) But people will think you're wise if you just be quiet. But, family, this is difficult for so many of us to do. Why? Because today everybody has a platform. Anybody can tweet this. They can go live here or they can start a podcast there. And what happens is you end up communicating certain information through a filter that you think you're using. You think this is healthy. You think you've kind of checked it. But in reality, there's some things that you miss. And so someone on the other end, they're processing what you just communicated through a completely different filter. And so then you say, well, I didn't say that. But then they respond with, but that's what I heard. And so when we do this, we're we're ruining the chance at relationship because people have already figured out, at least in their mind, who we are based on the things that we've communicated outside the protection of relationship. That's why relational equity is so important. And some of us We attempt to communicate hard truths to those who we haven't demonstrated real love towards. So it's not that what you're saying is wrong. It's not what you're saying is inaccurate. But you're saying it out of 
the wrong uh, relational uh, connection, that there needs to be some relational equity there before you can demonstrate those uh, truths. So truth is always received well when it's married with grace. But some of us, we don't care about that. We just want to get our point across. We just want to get whatever it is off of our chests and what we feel needs to be said. So you may say, well, if that's the problem, then what is the remedy? James 1.19 points that out for us when it says this. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be what? Y'all see it there? Should be quick to listen and what? Slow to speak and slow to become angry. So I, I know you're ready to respond, but wait, 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 wait. Just be quick to listen. I know you've got to tell them how wrong they are, but wait, 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 just be quick to listen. I know you're right, and you never get it wrong, and people don't understand your brilliance, but just be quick to listen. What if your ability to listen was the beginning of a miracle? And you're like, what are you talking about? In Acts 3, Peter and John They're walking into the temple, and understand this. It's not just them walking into the temple as if no one else is around. There are literally people everywhere. So so this is in Acts. The Holy Spirit has came and all that stuff, and and so it's just the church has been birthed. All these things are happening. So people are literally everywhere. So it's not just Peter and John walking into the temple. There's people everywhere. And this beggar, he was brought here every single day. He was carried and brought here to beg because literally the place is filled with people. Like, you know, imagine, you know, Times Square, right? So there's, there's so many people around. And so imagine how many people that he begged for, for money that he tried to stop and get their attention. Peter and John were not the only ones. So that meant Peter and John, they had to listen. And then to the point, they didn't just listen, but the Bible tells us that then they looked at him with intention. They looked at him with purpose. And through that encounter, they gave him something so much more than what he was actually asking for. When Peter says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So what if your ability to listen could be the beginning of a miracle for somebody else? That you just chose to slow down. And listen to them. So what if your ability to listen could help somebody walk out of depression? What if your ability to listen could help them walk out of anxiety? For the suicidal thoughts to stop. To turn their fear into faith. And move their doubt into trust in God. What if that was based in your ability to simply listen? So, family, we got to be neighbors who are committed to being quick to listen and slow to speak. But when you listen, when you give yourself time to just listen and be quiet, you make room for the Holy Spirit to then tell you what to speak, when to speak it, and the tone in which you communicate it. If I tell Katie, I love you, girl. (laughs) Versus like, babe, I love you. Which seems more receptive. Be quick. Somebody, I woke you up in here, right? (laughs) But just be quick to listen and slow to speak. So we got to listen to them. Second thing, we got to pray for them. You know that person that just get on your nerves? I know you do. Get them out of your head right now. You thinking about it. It's a thought bubble. But that person you can't stand. Like We know they exist. So don't play. We know they exist. It's that person walking down the hall. When you at work with your little work crew and they're coming down the hall, you're like, mm, there they go again. Probably headed to so-and-so office. You know they always brown nose and look at them. You know, see, you laughing because you know it. <laughs> or, or, you know, maybe it's that cousin at the family reunion that talked about the dire need that they had in their family. But yet they just got back from the European vacation. And you like, where's my money? <laughs> That's the person I'm talking about. But could we break it down a little bit more? Could it be the person whose political views are just so different than yours, and you didn't even know that they held those views? 
Or what about this? What about the person who hurt you so badly in church that you've asked yourself, how can they actually love Jesus how they're talking about? Family, these are real things. These are, are, are real things where we've been hurt by people, where people have disappointed us, and, and they've caused us so much pain. And so it just puts us in this place where we just talk about the ones who hurt us. Pray for them? You tripping. <laughs> we need to pray for you thinking that I'm going to pray for them. <laughs> but I have found this out, that it's a lot harder to talk about someone who you're praying for. Yes, them that hurt you. Yes, them that disappointed you. And you say, why am I being called to this? Because this is what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 4. He says, listen, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And, come on, you see it, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Family, we are called to pray for them. We are called to pray for the ones who have caused us pain. We are called to pray for the ones who have disappointed us. We are called to pray for those who have hurt us. So what if the moment we found ourselves talking about what they did? I'm not denying the hurt. Please don't hear that. But what if we found ourselves talking about what they did and we turn it to a moment of prayer? And I'm not talking about one of those moments where all we do is talk about them and at the end of the day we say, well, I guess I'll pray for them. But we kind of count that as praying for them. But what if we actually did it? I look at Jesus when he's up on the cross between two criminals. And with everything that has happened up to that point, the, the, the uh, accusations, the, the illegal trial, everything that's taken place. And he finds himself between these two criminals. And in Luke 23 and 34, he says, his father, forgive them. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What if your prayer for your neighbor revealed the destiny for your neighbor? You said, what are you talking about? So later on, one of these criminals, they end up placing their faith in Jesus. And Jesus' response to them was like, yo, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Could it be that the heart of that criminal was available to receive the revelation of who Jesus is because in a moment prior to that, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So what if your prayer for the people who have hurt you went to, Father, forgive them, even if they know what they did? And it ended up transforming their life. It ended up ushering them into their destiny. Jesus had all the right to just like, hey, I'm praying for them. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get one thing off. I ain't praying for them. I didn't did everything else. I didn't cast out this. I didn't heal that. I didn't raise that. I'm not praying for them. But his prayer, Father, forgive them, was not just, it was for everybody, but it was for those criminals as well. James 5.16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So in that moment, Jesus is being mocked and ridiculed, but he decided to pray for those who persecuted him. So just maybe our prayers for others will set the stage for transformation in their life. And I hear the pushback. Yeah, but that's Jesus. <laughs> My prayers don't do that, or I don't even know if I'm praying that way. But listen, it says the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, it's not about righteousness that you have. No, 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 no. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, the one who knew no sin, talking about Jesus, became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So now that means when we pray, James is talking about us. Not because of who we are, but because we have put our faith in Jesus and we've become the righteousness of God through him. So now our prayers are effective and they do avail much. And so maybe, just maybe, if you decide to pray for those who have hurt you, pray for those who have persecuted you, that it can lead to transformation and them walking in the calling and destiny that God has for the life. Family, prayer is the channel that leads to transformation. 
And we cannot exclude prayer if we love this city. We cannot exclude prayer if we love the people around us. Now, as I close with this, I'm going to land this plane. I want to challenge us to be committed to being a praying neighbor, not a gossiping one. Here's the last way that we love our neighbors is we forgive them. Colossians 3.13, it says this, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive some of the people, nah, anyone who offends you. Remember, jog your memory, remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Now it's interesting to note that Paul doesn't say, Forgive and forget. But he says, forgive and remember. I'm going to get back to that forgive and forget in just a moment. But we forgive and remember because, come on, let's be honest. We can look back and we can see our flaws. We can see our issues and our struggles and just how jacked up we were and are. But then we can remember what God has done for us. And because of that, we can forgive. Because when we do in that moment, family, we are ultimately celebrating what we remember, that God has forgiven us. So who are we to withhold forgiveness? Who are we to say, no, 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 they're not deserving of that. Well, family, neither neither was us, neither were you. So we got to get to this place where we say, I know you hurt me, but I remember what God did for me. I know you said this about me, and I know how that made me feel, and I know how it kept me up at night. But I remember what God did for me. The lies you told about me, the pain you caused, losing my hair, thought I was losing my mind, all of that. I won't choose to forgive you because I remember what God did for me. And you may say, how? How can that be a reality? Look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, putting aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, let us run with patient endurance the race that has been set before us. Here it is. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. That's how you do it, family. How do you get rid of the weight And the issues and the hurt and the pain and the disappointment that can oftentimes trip us up, look to Jesus. Because ultimately, family, the weight and the sins are distractions that keep us from walking out our calling and purpose. And the remedy for this is for us to change our focus and look to Jesus. We got to forgive them. We can't let these distractions and we can't let these struggles and we can't let these things keep us and weigh us down. But I have realized that many of us were carrying weight that we were never meant to carry. And because of that, there's no grace to walk out what you are attempting to walk out. Like God graces us for the things that he has called us to in the spaces and places that he has called us to go. But there are things that we try to go in these places that he's called us to go, that we're carrying things that he says, but that's not supposed to be what's in your hands. And so I got, I got some, some weights over here. Some light weights, some 25s. I'll be sweating in a minute. But this is what some of us look like. We're trying to walk out what God has called us to walk out. We're trying to live in purpose and we're trying to to, to walk in the destiny and, and do the things that God has called us to live. But yet, we're walking with these weights. And it's, it's easy in the beginning. It's, it's, it's nothing in the beginning. But over time, the weight's pulling you down. You, you're not who you are. It's not that others don't recognize you. You don't recognize you. It's because you're carrying this weight that you weren't meant to carry. 
And then you come in a space like this, you come in this place and, and, and you want to connect with worship. And you, you say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to surrender to you. And, and then you try to lift, and, and there's weight. You say, Lord, I, I, I want to go all in with you. In a minute you try to pick up what he's trying to, you can't because there's, there's something in your hands. You can't even get what he wants to put in your hands. There's this weight that you're carrying. And so at some point, eventually, it's like the weight's not even there anymore. <sighs> because the weight has become your identity. It's just become normal. And so you're used to it. And you can't even look at old pictures because you saw your smile before the wait. You can't even want, you don't even want to remember old memories because it was before you were carrying the weight. And we're holding these things from people who have done things to us. <laughs> they don't even know that they did it. And we want to say, you look at this weight. Look what you've put in my hands. They don't even know that they hurt you. Family. We've got to release the weight. I'm going to release the weight, Nina. There you go. We've got to release the weight. We can't be who God has called us to be. We can't love this city, love the people of this city if we're carrying weight that we were never meant to carry. So I said I was going to come back to forgive and forget. Culture says that forgive and forget means you offended me and I'll forget it until the next time you offend me and then I'll bring it up. While kingdom says that forgive and forget means I remember that it happened and the pain that it caused, but I am not allowing a moment of pain to guide my life. And that's the space that some of us sit in. That we forgive, but yet the pain of what they did is still controlling us. That we're not even free to be who God has called us to be and to be an, an agent of change, to be a difference maker in the spaces that we're supposed to because what people have done to us, the pain, the hurt, the disappointment is guiding our lives. And so we're not even viewing life actually through vision, but we're, through, we're viewing life through pain. We're viewing life through hurt and disappointment. We can't even celebrate when someone else uh, wins. We can't even get excited for something else because we're always seeing everything thing through pain. Oh, that's that's what happened to you. That was awesome. Well, I don't know. Don't get too excited because something's going to happen on the backside. Oh, that's too good. And we just become this jaded person. But here's what forgiving remember means. It means the memory is still there, but the authority is gone. So that hurt they don't have authority. Oh, I remember how it felt. You got to be honest. Sometimes like, I don't even remember the pain. No, you remember how that hurt. A wasp has stung me three times before. I remember how that hurt. <laughs> but I still go outside. We have to release the authority and say, no, yes, that hurt. I forgive you. The memory is there. But the authority is going Why? Because forgiveness equals freedom, while unforgiveness equals bitterness. And you can't be who God has called you to be. Will you pray with me today?